Hi, welcome. Now that we've described statements of cash flows in the abstract, it's time to get real by looking at statements of cash flows of actual companies. And as with income statements and balance sheets, I'm going to start with the life cycle perspective. Remember there are three sections to the cash flow statement. There's operating cash flows, there's investing cash flows, there's financing cash flows. And here's what you should expect to see as companies are born in age. With very young companies, you should expect to see negative cash flows from operating. Why? Because they have very little in net income or they're losing money and they might have working capital needs. You should have negative cash flows from investing because you're putting money in to grow in the future. The only positive cash flow you get is in financing and that's because you're raising new equity or new debt. So operating cash flows will be negative, investing cash flows will be negative, financing cash flows will be positive because you're raising money. With the young growth, you're going to see a continuation of that trend. Operating cash flows will continue to be negative. Investing cash flows will reflect the fact that there's continued investment to, to capture future growth. And financing cash flows will still be positive because you're raising new equity, either because you're going public or because venture capitalists are supplying your equity. As you get to be a high growth firm, your operating cash flows now have a chance of turning positive. They might not, but they have a chance. Why? Because you're starting to make money. Your investing cash flows stay negative because you're still a growth company. And your financing cash flows will start to become neutral. In other words, you're, st you're no longer raising equity like you used to, but you're definitely not paying out dividends and you're not buying back stock and you're trying not to use debt. As you become a mature growth company, your, your operating cash flows will become increasingly positive. You're making more money and your working capital needs become a smaller percentage of that money you make. Your investing will stabilize. You're not investing as much as you used to. And relative to your scale as a company, it's dropped off. And your financing cash flows start to see the first inflows you get because you've started to borrow money. And perhaps your first outflows to equity investors, a small buyback, a small dividend. As you become a stable company, your operating cash flows should now be positive and stable. Your investing cash flows will level off. It will be more, mostly maintenance investing. You're not pumping up your assets or at best you're putting your depreciation back into CapEx and a little bit more. And you're now going to see regular debt issuances become part of your cash flows. And you're going to find that when you repay old debt, it's often with new debt. And not surprisingly, you're buying back more stock, you're paying more dividends. You're going to decline, your operating cash flows start to drop off because you're making less money. Your investing cash flows could now become a positive cash flow. Why? Because you're selling assets rather than investing in them. You're shrinking as a business. And in your financing cash flows, if, you're, if you have good sense, you'll be bringing your debt down. You should see debt repayments and increasing cash flow returns equity because you're shrinking as a company. So let's see if this plays out. Let's start again with Peloton young company, fitness equipment uh, company that makes its money from equipment and subscriptions. Let's look at what the statement of cash flows tells you. First, let's look at the big line items. If you look at the cash from investing, operating and financing, the operating and investing cash flows, not surprisingly, are negative. Why? Because it's a young company. The financing cash flow is positive, but only because you raise 539 million in new equity. It's equity issuances that I make now. So the cash provided by operating is negative because you're a young company that's money losing, but you're kind of covering those cash flows by issuing new stock. Your investing is also obviously negative. Young company, negative investing. One interesting feature here that I want to talk about is the fact that stock-based compensation is being added back. Now you can see the logic for this, right? This is a cash flow statement. And if you're paying your employees with shares, you're really not paying cash. So when you report your income and it's after employee compensation, and that compensation was primarily in the form of stock, you're saying it's a non-cash expense, you're adding it back. I think there's a big difference or between depreciation and stock-based compensation. And I'll come back and talk about it in the next session. But that's not surprising with a young company. Let's move one step up the ladder and look at Netflix. Again, if you look at its operating cash flows, its operating cash flows reflect the fact that it's it's making money now. But the biggest expense that Netflix has that makes its operating cash flows negative is how much it's spending on content. I know people talk about how much Netflix spends on content. The best place to see it is in the statement of cash flows, not in the income statement where you should see an expense because that's an accounting expense. This is how much Netflix is actually spending on content. In 2019, Netflix spent $13.9 billion in addition to content. 
hey, you spend 13.9 billion, even if you make some money, 1.9 billion net income, your cash flows from operations are going to be negative. So Netflix is making money, but it's negative cash flows from operations. If you look at the investing activities, there's not much going on. And are you surprised? Their biggest investing isn't content. It shows up as part of their operating. What I'm trying to say is while accountants make a big deal about separating operating from investing, from financing cash flows, with companies like Netflix, they mess up. Their biggest investing cash flow is, in fact, the investment in content. It's now showing up as part of an operating cash flow. If you look at their financing cash flows, you know, Netflix is starting to use debt. And you can see that in the in how much more they're raising from debt issuances than they pay off in debt. So when you look at the cash flows from financing, much of their financing of those negative cash flows more operations are coming from borrowing more money. Now we can debate whether this is a sensible thing to do or not, but it's a reality you face with Netflix. This is a company that is negative cash flows from operations, doesn't spend much in investing in the traditional sense, but makes up for those negative cash flows from financing, primarily from debt. Incidentally, those line items that you see highlighted under two, basically that's a consolidated working capital. It's not a big deal for Netflix, but I want to kind of focus in again. I've mentioned earlier when we talked about cash flows, the signs on the cash flows tell you which direction the cash flows are. So when it says are the current assets minus 252 million, basically that means that other current assets created a negative cash flow of 252 million. You know what had to happen for that to be true? Other current assets must have increased by 252 million. When current assets go up, it's a negative cash flow. When current liabilities go up, it's a positive cash flow. Accounts payable being a positive cash flow tells you accounts payable went up. If you consolidate all of these items, you get the change in non-cash working capital. If that number is a positive number, if your non-cash working capital increased, it's a decrease in your cash flows, a drain on your cash flows. If that number decreases, then it's an increase in your cash flows. It's kind of tough to get that sign change in your head, but get in your head when you look at statements of cash flows. Now let's look at Coca-Cola. Like Peloton, you see stock-based compensation expense added back. But you know what? With Coca-Cola, it's not as big an issue because it's not as big an item relative to the size of the company. When you're making 8.9 billion in net income, the fact that you have $201 million in compensation expenses is not going to alter your story for the company. But it is, in fact, still being added back because it's a non-cash expense. You'll also notice acquisitions of businesses, equity investments, and non-marketable securities all consolidated. That's not great practice if you ask me. I'd much rather that they be broken down because they're very different kinds of investments. But they, you know, Coca-Cola is consolidating both an operating investment, acquisitions of businesses, with non-operating investments in equity method investments and non-marketable securities all in one line item. As with Netflix, you see debt be a cash flow. But here, if you if you look at the debt cash flows, you get a very interesting phenomenon. Netflix, I'm sorry, Coca-Cola in 2019 paid $25 billion back in debt, but they issued $23 billion. And that's something you will notice as companies mature as you see debt payments and debt issuances start to even out, especially the company's intent on maintaining its debt ratios. The company did spend $1.1 billion in buybacks and $6.8 billion in dividends. But Coca-Cola doesn't seem to be buying back stock to retire the stock or take it off the books. They're putting it as treasury stock. That might be a temporary stock. They can change their minds. But you see the phenomena play out in the state and the cash flows. Now let's turn to Toyota. One of the items you'll notice for Toyota, which shows up in other statements of cash flows, is one of the items that you get for cash flows is deferred income taxes. Now the way to think about deferred income taxes is these are taxes you're paying from previous years, right? 86.6 billion. Now, if you go to Toyota's income statement, you'll see an income tax item, right? Deferred taxes reflect what you paid over and above that. So if you see 100 million as a tax expense in your income statement, and you see another 50 million as a negative cash flow in your statement of cash flows, in some total that year, the company paid 150 million. So deferred income taxes, in this case, is a negative cash flow. You're paying off taxes from previous years, so it's a negative cash flow. 
Now, if you look at the dividends, there are three line items here, dividends to Toyota shareholders. So basically, you know, Toyota is a, is a second class of shares that they pay dividends on, but dividends, no matter who they go to, are cash outflows. So think of all of those cash flows as cash leaving the company. Now, as you look across sectors, as with income statements and balance sheet, there will be line items that show up in statements of cash flows that are divergent, but not as many because statements of cash flows ultimately are about cash in, cash out. And what does it matter whether a company is an oil company, a pharmaceutical company or a bank? No, but let's take a look at an oil company. If you look at Total, the, the, the French oil company, you'll notice depreciation amortization. You're saying that's shown up in all of the statements of cash flows. What's the big deal? Notice how big it is for Total. Now, because depreciation, because depreciation and, dep and amortization is such a big line item, you can have you know, oil companies that are money losing, but cash flow positive because the depreciation is not a cash expense. Now, later on, when we get to financial analysis and we talk about how to price companies, we'll talk about how people use EBITDA multiples. And one reason people like to use EBITDA multiples is while companies can be money losing, if they have a big depreciation charge like they do for Tata, you can end up with a positive cash flow. So depreciation, depletion, amortization and impairment. The reason we added back is the non-cash expense because it's so large. It can alter our perception about this company as a cash flow producing company. Now, if you look at the cash flows and investing, you'll notice that there's a lot more disposals here as part of the right. This is part of the regular course of business. So it's not something you should be ignoring. It's something they do in the regular course because it shows up every year. In contrast, if you see proceeds from disposal and they show up in only one out of every five or 10 years, Maybe it's an unusual disposal and you should not be factoring when forecasting. But remember, ultimately, you, you look at financials to get a sense of what will they look like in the future. And here it looks like these line items will continue to be there going forward. Now, when you look at banks, I'll be quite honest, I look at the statement of cash flows for HSBC and I have no idea what to make of it. And that in general is what I would say about statements of cash flows for banks. With regular companies, there is information I get from a statement of cash flows of the bank. There's very little I learn. In fact, as you go through the line items, what, what should strike you is how many line items there are. And I'm not sure what they tell you about the company. So here's my bottom line with the bank. The reality is estimating cash flows for a bank is almost impossible to do. A statement of cash flows is not going to get you there. Later, when we get to financial analysis, we'll talk about other ways in which you might estimate cash flows. But I look at the statement of cash flows and my reaction is resignation. I really have no idea what's going on here. And with financial service companies in general, statements of cash flows become much less informative because each line item, you're not sure what it even means. We close with pharmaceutical companies. And I've highlighted what Dr. Reddy's lab, the Indian pharmaceutical company, has listed as its investing cash flows. Okay. The biggest single line item is purchase of investments, which have nothing to do with operations. You know, this is one of those cases where a statement of cash flows is hiding the elephant in the room. We all know what Dr. Reddy's lab's biggest investment for the future is. It's R&D expenses. You're saying, why isn't it showing up in my statement of cash flows? It is. You know where it's showing up? It's showing up because the net income you started with was already after that R&D. It's hidden. So my point with pharmaceutical companies is when you look at the investing activities and you see very little going on in terms of investing in operations, don't jump to the conclusion this company is not investing back in the business because its investment takes the form of R&D. And as I said, I'll come back and talk about R&D-like expenses that accountants, I think, consistently miscategorize. But my point with this statement of cash flows is we're missing the elephant in the room because the biggest investment for the future is hidden away from you because it's already being subtracted out to get net income. So here's the bottom line. The statement of cash flows looks at cash flows at a business through the eyes of equity investors. That's why we start with net income. There is information in each of the three pieces. The cash flows from operations tell you how mature this company is because this company is mature, that cash flow will go from negative to positive. The cash flows from investing will tell you something about what this company thinks about its own future. 
Companies that are optimistic about growth in the future should be investing more than companies that are not. And the financing activities tells you something about the mix of debt and equity that this company has and how it's changing over time. So if your objective is to estimate cash flows prior to debt payments, not after debt payments, you can start with the statement of cash flows, but you have a little work to do. Because that statement of cash flows is after debt payments, you've got to add back your debt pay, debt cash flows, which are in the statement, but you also have to add back interest expenses because that is subtracted out to get to net income. But a statement of cash flows tells you cash in, cash out. And from that perspective, I think it gives you information you can use to analyze the company. I hope you found this session useful. Thank you very much for listening.